Hello, good afternoon or good morning or whatever it is in the place where you are. Um, I'm just checking that everything is good on the broadcast. And yes, perfect. Okay. So um, my name is Diogo. I'm a global change maker since 2012. And basically, we are going to, to have together something like 50 minutes. And I'd like to do this in the following way for, for you that are over there. First, I'll just introduce myself. Like, like, why the hell did I come here to talk about grassroots action and advocating for change? Such a, a fancy title. <laughs> and basically, it's really to, to try to make this the most interactive possible. So I'll just introduce myself quite briefly. And then you can go and push, put your questions on, on your YouTube link. You just have on the menu, on the bar, you can see where to put the questions. I've already put two texts there, two comments there, just to kickstart it. But then throughout the, the webinar, feel free to, to put your questions. And I'll try to go uh, according to your questions and to answer them. Because I've done this before also with Global Change Makers, and I, the really rich part was for me was the end when I finally opened it up for Q&A and it was quite interesting and I wish I had more time that time. So let's try to make it good this time. So I'm also going to share with you my screen just for this first part. And then I'm going to change again for me. So bear with me for just some seconds. Okay, it's sharing the screen. Perfect. There you go. So, first of all, in Portugal, when we say thank you, we say muito obrigado. And so, for me, that's the, the very, very first part, which is muito obrigado to you that are over there. And it's always good to, to have these kind of opportunities to talk a little bit about what I'm doing, but more than talking about myself is really talking about change and talking about how we can make good better. And so I'm really thankful to have you on that side, whether you are live now or seeing this after, because I know for a lot of you right now, it's like sleeping time. So <laughs> thanks for taking the time to watch and taking the time to be with me. And for me, this is just the beginning of a conversation. If you feel good about talking again, please feel free to engage with me further and to keep working together because for me it's really important that and I feel ever more we need to work together towards the same goals. So just a brief introduction also, if you have any questions, feel free to put your questions on the YouTube channel and I'll try to answer them the best I can. I'll start with this photo. So the very first photo I have is from something like 12 years ago. Um, I was so yeah, 10, 10 years ago, I was 17 or 16 in this photo. I don't know exactly. <laughs> this was in Switzerland with a very good friend of mine that's called Carolina. We both are quite different nowadays, <laughs> but this is important for me just because it was the very beginning of, in my opinion, of my route to understanding what kind of impact I wanted to have in the world. And I was a Boy Scout, so I've done a lot of volunteering even before the university. But I, it was in this summer when I was in Switzerland, and this summer for me was very, very active in very different occasions, that I really understood that putting your talent or putting your skills um, at the service of other people was something very meaningful. And even if you are not the best in the world in something, whatever it is that you have as skills, whatever it is you have as, as a talent can already make a difference. And that for me was very important because I was always very competitive and trying to be the best in everything. And, and I was the kind of picky guy in, in the judging decisions in every single context. Uh, but in the end, it was in the summer that I really understood, okay, I, I want to make a difference for my life and for the life of others with whatever I have. And sometimes it will just be a good vibe and a smile to share or, or some, some bad joke, <laughs> some dead bad joke. And that's basically what I've done throughout my life. After this, in the university, I went to a project called 
Transformers project. It was a nationwide project. And I've done this for three years of my life. While I was in university, which I say I, I was in the university part-time and in Transformers full-time because I really was working a lot on this, working on the weekends and everything. And I really felt in Transformers that any talent could make a difference. And Transformers had a very, very powerful idea. It departed from the assumption that we all have a talent and that with that talent, we can make a difference in the lives of other people. And for me, it's totally resonated. And in the case of Transformers, what we did was throughout a whole year with a lot of different people that we called mentors. These were the people coming to us and saying, I'd like to share my talents in graffiti, in football, in parkour, in photography, in anything, really. We had a lot of different activities and they would share that talent with kids, but with a catch, which was in the end of the year, you have to do a payback. You have to have a moment in which you, with your talents, are going to impact your community, just with your talent, just with the things you've been training. And a very good example for me, and I usually give this example because it totally makes sense to me, which is the very first, uh, in the very first year, a group of B-boys and B-girls from one, one neighborhood around Lisbon from a... Um, an area with a lot of underprivileged people and people living in not so good conditions. And what they did is, okay, we've been training breakdance for the whole year. So now with breakdance, what kind of difference can we make in our community? And what they did was a battle in which for you to participate or for you to engage in the, engage in the battle, you had to bring food and you had to bring uh, clothes. And with that clothes and that food, you sh they shared it with their community and it was quite a simple idea of course this wasn't like totally transforming for the community it wasn't because of this single battle that all lives changed but this very small action this very small uh, idea of making a difference whatever big or small making a difference and making it with what you already have with your talents was quite powerful for me and that's why I, in the last year of the university, I applied for Global Change Makers. This was 2012. I applied for Global Change Makers. I was selected. Uh, I really wasn't expecting to be selected. I thought, okay, this is Global Change Makers. And I'm just a kid in Lisbon doing some things with a project called Transformers and saying we all have superpowers. So <laughs> what kind of difference can I make? And, and where do I fit in this world? Because these are Global Change Makers. And I don't know, still today, I, I try to understand why, the, why they did select me, but this was a great opportunity for me. And I was in my last year of university studying economics, really not knowing what I would do next. I didn't have the money to pay for a, mar for a master's. My parents didn't have the money for, to afford my master's too. And, and so I knew I had to work, but I didn't know where or what I was going to do next. And it was in Global Change Makers in London in 2012 with 60 other young people from all over the world that I understood that making a change and focusing on impact was something that made a difference. And that was something that made total sense for me as the rest of my life. And what I had been seeing up until that moment as something that was just for my free time, I thought, how can I make a profession out of this? And my first job was this, the next photo. This was in a, what we call in Portugal, a social neighborhood, which is basically a place where people lived in slums, but the social uh, state provided houses for them. The problem is, okay, they got the people out of the slums and they put them in good public housing. But the problem is most of these people were living out of agriculture, most of these people were quite underprivileged. They were from different communities that they clashed with each other with different ethnicities. And basically what you did is putting agricultures, um, putting people doing agriculture inside buildings in the middle of the city. And what happened is that people basically clashed a lot within each other. And also uh, there was loads of problems like use unemployment, criminality, and all these kind of things. And also on the other way around, although they were in the middle of the city, 
they were totally ignored by the authorities and by the city of Lisbon. And so I was working there with the Youth and Employment Project and there I understood, okay, I'm learning a lot about social service and social work, but I'm not learning so much about management. And I really felt what I wanted to do was being a manager of a social institution. And that's why I changed for a different company that was called iMatch. I was there for three years. And this is basically an entrepreneurship and innovation company. Uh, we did a lot of projects with big, big companies like in Portugal, you might know Vodafone, uh, BMW, Leroy Merlin, which is a, a French company for those of you who are from Europe, you should know Leroy Merlin too. And for three years, that's basically what I did day and night uh this was me in a break during an event trying to drink the beer that we had for free for the guests and this was just in the end of the day trying to trying to drink that beer and then we still had to to work on just putting the event and and just working and for me it was amazing like learning entrepreneurship learning innovation but again the impact was something that was lacking and it was while i was at imatch that i read this book and I totally recommend the book, This Changes Everything, because this is a book by Naomi Klein about one thing that nowadays we know as climate change. And this for me really changed everything because up until this moment, I was a lot focused in social impact, but environment was something for me in my narrow view, something of nature, not something of humans. And by reading This Changes Everything, I understood for the first time how interconnected we are with everything in nature, how much we are a part of nature instead of being apart from nature, and how much we were ruining our own house. And climate change became a, a really big thing for me. And this is just one quick example of, um, of what's happening right now. And these are the kind of stories that I was reading back then and, and that resonated with me the concentration this is the concentration of co2 in the atmosphere from 800,000 years ago up until now we are in that oaky stick we are right in the end here you can see 2016 but actually now we are above the 400 number over there so like we've never been in a world where so much concentration of co2 like we were we as homo sapiens the um, the scientific agreement is that we were born basically around 300,000 years ago, which is actually further than the middle of this graph. And this led to the, the highest CO2 concentration ever. Ten hottest years ever registered were within the last 20 years. And we started listening about climate chaos and uh, all we were doing about humanity. And this, this is basically what is leading to natural catastrophes which are not so natural if they are human induced and we know we, they are human induced nowadays like katrina like hurricane sandy just in the united states it's for big media uh, catastrophes not so much in the media but in puerto rico irma and maria hurricanes basically they devastated puerto rico in 2017 but also wildfires like these ones in Greece, in California, just last year, but also in Portugal, in my own country, in the same year in Pedrogo and in Leiria, we had a huge loss of forests. And we lost over 60 people in this year to fire. And although this was fire that people put the fire, and we know this today, that the fire was put by people, the natural conditions for the fire to spread, they are induced by our activities in nature and they are induced by the way we change climate. And also Syria. A lot of times we, we relate climate to, to this kind of events like natural catastrophes, but also war and conflict. In the case of Syria, for five years before the war broke, there was a drought an extreme drought, and that led to a huge loss of agriculture in a place where they weren't so much connected to the rest of the world in terms of international commerce. And that led to a big, big social pressure for the state to, to answer, and the state answer to the social mobilization with guns 
and by killing people and that also led to a widespread conflict that then led to refugees and in a lot of senses these people are already climate refugees because it was climate induced problems that led to the social problems they were facing and then with this kind of regimes this is what happens to these kind of people and nowadays we know and we have the projections for the number of refugees worldwide and it's really really in the millions and close to the billion people that are going to be faced with a status of climate refugee in the next 50 years and so this is the reality we live right now and that's why for me in the end it, it has all to do with this like who suffers and who will be okay and the irony about all this is that the ones who suffer the most are the ones that had the least responsibility in causing the problem and no it's not a natural problem because we know the causes of this we know in terms of co2 budgets basically we've put in, we've been putting a lot of carbon dioxide and other um, other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and we know that out of all the reserves of fossil fuels in the world we can only burn 12 percent if we are to reach the paris agreement of staying below two degrees of increase from the pre-industrial area these are just some quick facts for us to know where we are but in terms of solutions we have a lot of solutions and that's a good part we know we have renewable like solar like wind we know like a plant-based diet is quite important and eating less meat and less fish if we can afford to do it going by train and we have a lot of our other solutions but the the road to get there we have the the paris agreement which was a very very good manifesto for action and a very good deal indeed but still the states haven't been doing enough and a lot of times we've been talking about individual action and in my opinion it is very important that each one of us does their individual part but the urgency of the problem and the, the rate at which we need to change demands political action the un has just reported last year that we have up until 2030 to cut down global emissions by 45 percent and just for as a case of comparison right now the global emissions are not even going down and we need to cut them in 45 percent from the levels they were in 2010 just in 11 years that's the reality we are facing if we want to reach the paris agreement this is what needs to happen and that's where uh, the mobilization part comes in i work in a um, collective of activists for climate justice called climasim if you want to, to then follow our our things you can follow on this link through instagram but also I've come back to transformers and trying to understand what might be the role of arts and the role of other different talents in mobilizing people and advocating for change. And right now, and I'll end up with this, I'm working with this new organization called Two Degrees Artivism with three main goals in our mission. First, to mobilize artists for this kind of change, then to empower these artists to have art that makes a change and then connect them because what we understood so far is that we have a lot of artists doing art for climate justice and for raising awareness and for demanding change and all of this but they are still not connected so the action is not resonating in the media and is not resonating uh, worldwide also and so just final part of my introduction um if you want to to connect further you can connect with me through diogo and silva but then the other two projects i talked to you about are this two degrees artivism and climasim and now what i'm going to do is exit this presentation see which questions you have and depart for q a because i would really love to do this in a more interactive way than just me speaking this for me was the introduction to the point of okay why do we need advocacy what kind of advocacies do we need and how can we empower the grassroots from there but i would like to depart to those answers from your questions so i'll just change this and stop uh, stop the screen share there you go back to me maybe yes okay and i'll go to to your questions okay 
So, so far, we have no questions, okay. Perfect, so if you have any questions, please feel free to, to put them there in the, in the chat. But I'll go through what I have here too. So, first of all, for me, what is grassroots mobilization and, and what does that mean for, for our world? Um, in my opinion, and, and basing on, on the work we've been doing, doing something grassroots is doing something from the bottom up. And that's important because, and I'll do the, the rationing from the other way around. That's important because first, we can make individual actions, like I've almost totally turned vegetarian. I try to avoid riding planes, although I still go on planes and that's bad, yes. Um, I also try to go on public transport. I don't own a car. Uh, I try to don't buy clothes. I try to just go secondhand or if I can change the clothes with someone uh, that has something that they don't use anymore, I'll do that. And I've implemented all those changes individually. But in the end, for the, the big change we need right now, mostly in terms of, of climate, but I would say really for, for a lot of different issues, we need political action because we need widespread action. And the time things take to go from some early adopters of sustainable practices like going vegetarian and all these examples I was telling you, up until that is widespread adoption, it takes a lot of time, and that a lot of time we don't have if we want to reach the Paris Agreement and if we want to have a livable planet for everyone and for every people on Earth to be born with a feeling that they can live in a world and live a dignified life independently of where they were born and the conditions in which they were born and the family that they have around and the institutions they have around. And so the political action for, for me, it's uh, one of the key issues in, in reaching this change we want. But then for the politicians to act, and that is obviously um, understanding that we live in a democracy, because if you live in a, in a place where democracy doesn't work that well, this is not always the case, what I'm going to say next. And that's also a problem. A lot of times we need to fix uh, the systems and institutions and then exert social pressure. But in a working and functioning democracy, what happens is that when you build social pressure from the ground up, then the politicians act. Because we elect them, we vote for them, they know the polls, and since they, all, they know all this, if we manage to shift the public opinion from one thing to the other, and that happens with people in the streets, and that happens with a lot of communication and not only people in the streets. If we manage to shift public opinion to one side, then we know that the politicians will act to that. And that's what we are seeing right now, for instance, with the global youth climate strike movement. That's what's been happening worldwide. We've, we've been seeing a lot of pressuring, pressure building from the ground up, and kids are a great means of, of messaging, and kids and, and Young students are a great means for the media. This is perfect because this like the future generations demanding action for their future. And all of this has been great in turning the public opinion. And that's why we are seeing the differences we are seeing in countries declaring climate emergency and in a lot of countries acting a lot faster than they were acting like two or three years ago. And all these movements have been building up, like the Fridays for Future is a big one. Extinction Rebellion is also a big one with different kind of methods. They work with civil disobedience, which is basically doing something illegal for moral reasons, like cutting a bridge and standing in the middle of the bridge and don't letting the, the cars come in. That's illegal, but they say they are doing that for uh, public awareness for the media to come there and they get arrested because of that basically to say we need to change and in the case of the UK this has really been the case that's what's been happening so Extinction Rebellion together with the and use climate strike that's in the UK that's what's been building up the movement even in the middle of Brexit which is quite interesting because 
in my opinion, if we manage to have the kind of pressure they manage to build um, in our own countries, that will make a big difference. Because if they manage to do that in, in the case of Brexit and all, with all the talk about Brexit, imagine if they didn't have a Brexit to deal with. And that's the case of Portugal. And that's why I'm working with the youth climate strike to understand how can we get the protests and get the, the demonstrations widespread enough and with enough social support for the politicians to act towards what we want. And now I have a question there from Carolina, which is what is the special power of arts? Okay, that's a quite, a quite difficult question to answer. I would say the, in this kind of movements, you have, you have to have two things. You have to have um, political statements and political proposals, and you have to have media attention. And they go hand in hand, of course, because when you get media attention, you get the political statement, and you can only um, go through the political statements and make it make those political objectives reach their goals if we have the media attention. But there are a lot of things that are more political or more media. And in the case of a demonstration, a lot of times it is about the number of people that are in the streets because it's, it's about how representative it is of the general population. And so in that sense, that's quite political. A lot of times we see the images of a demonstration, but we don't even know the, the right topics that they are demanding action from their government. And that's... In that sense, it's something that it has a lot to do with the numbers of people that, that represent that. In terms of the arts, it's something that grabs media attention. It touches us emotionally a lot of times more than just a statement saying we demand these 10 things. And so, in my opinion, the arts are very, very powerful for, for two things. One is to grab media attention because a lot of times with a small number of artists, you can do something that has a huge media impact or even with one famous artist, if you do something good enough and, and something that is connects with the people enough, it can really be widespread. And so it's one for, um, for a media attention. And the second is really the emotional connection. We've been in the, the activism movement for, for climate change and in everything that has been said about climate change. We've been able to give all the arguments, like the science is there. We are totally 100% backed by science. And that's a good thing because it's like, we have the facts on our side, that's for sure. And yet it hasn't been enough to mobilize people to change their own lives and to mobilize governments and corporations and big institutions to act towards that change. And in my opinion, but that's of course my personal opinion, um, it, it has a lot to do with us giving a lot of rational arguments, but not so much the emotional arguments. Like the photos I was showing you, these are photos of real people. And for this webinar, I tried to search the stories of the people that were behind those photos. And that's a lot of times where we connect, is when I listen to the story of this guy that is on top of a truck in the middle of a flood that comes after a hurricane. And this is, is something that nowadays, and I've tried to search the stories of those photos, it's quite difficult to search those stories. I don't know the name of that guy, I don't know the age, I don't know even what happened after that photo. And the arts and storytelling and connecting in an in emotional level, in my opinion, in my personal opinion, is something that is really lacking in this movement. So we have the facts, but if I tell you the story of this young person and how just holding to that truck was enough and the only thing really that he could do to save his life, and if I then tell you the facts, about the number of lives that we weren't able to save in that situation, 
And if I tell you the facts about the number of people that got without a home after this for months, or even the number of people that had to be in the roofs of their own houses or their neighbor houses for I don't know how many days, just holding for action and for rescue to reach there, then we can connect. And the arts, in my opinion, are something that are exactly this, whether it is a, a story through photography or through video or through documenting, or whether it is a, a painting or whether it is a song or whether it is a, a theater or a drama or a play, all of this, it's like, uh, it's total emotional connection. And if that is well done, backed by science, backed by facts, I believe we can move people to change and to make a difference in their own lives. And then we can move governments, big institutions, big corporate uh, organizations, everything, because in the end, all of these institutions and organizations are made by people. So when we generalize saying, oh, but that company doesn't do nothing. Like that company might be like 20,000 20, people uh, within the company saying the company is doing nothing. It's quite a generalization. And so if we connect to these people, then they can make the change from within. And also we as clients, but also others as shareholders, also others as politicians regulating this organizations and we all if we are all aware of the change we need to act that's when the, the difference makes sense in my opinion and now veronica considering your experience how far away do you think we are from taking into account all the social and environmental externalities of the current businesses Whew. another big question <laughs> um well I, this is really a belief. I, I haven't read the science uh, on this, so, so I can only tell by my personal experience and for what I'm, what I'm feeling. I feel like really counting, like financially taking into account the social and environmental externalities of business, I, I feel like we are at least 10 years away from that because all our current economic system is based on that. Is based on not counting the externalities, uh, eternal growth, and all of this. So I believe it, it will take a lot of time to, to have that kind of financial account. But taking into account in, in terms of that being something that is considered in the decision, I don't feel like we are so far away from that. And I'm going to give you one, one simple example. I have a friend working in Unilever in London. They are probably one of, of the biggest companies worldwide for consumer goods. And, and so they, they have a huge financial incentive to keep doing the things the way they are being done. And Unilever CEO, the former CEO called Paul Pullman, he decided that sustainable development was something that was very important for the bottom line of the company, for what they were doing. And he started to incorporate these processes to, through the business. And nowadays, this friend of mine working in Unilever, what she told me is that for every single project, every single new project, and she was in the marketing department working in new product development, for every single new project, what they did is they will evaluate the financial return, but also the impact on the environment that that product will have, and how could it benefit both the environment and the society as a whole. And so this is Unilever, one of the biggest companies worldwide. They are taking this into account already. We are seeing a lot of CEOs, a lot of, even a lot of politicians, of course, a lot of big social institutions talking about this. And in my opinion, we first need to start talking to then walking the talk. So if we are already seeing a lot of talk, in my opinion, the, the walk part won't be that far away. And so I really feel that 10 years from now, if you are here to stay as a business, every business will take that into account. Maybe not financially, like saying, if I produce X amount of CO2, um, I will 
charge that, but not financially in terms of considering it into the decision making. I really feel that's something quite possible. So I have no more questions, but I'll then try to answer some some of the things that were even in my mind when I was trying to when I was trying to prepare the to prepare the workshop and the webinar. Um, one of the things is really how, how can we mobilize people? How can we get people together? One of the very interesting things for me for the Fridays for Future movement, the, this movement of young kids doing the climate strikes, is that it was quite unorganized. So in, in my opinion, it's very difficult, difficult to push a movement, to make a movement go and, and to control every step of the movement. There's a, a very good book called Tipping Point about how can you make things go viral. And it has very good points on this, so, so I'll say those. First, it's very important the kind of message you are passing. I guess for a lot of times, uh, the environmental message, the climate change message was about polar bears and nature and how we need to protect nature. And if everyone, even if it's unconsciously, if everyone has this idea that you are not a part of nature, then you will only protect nature out of solidarity. And that's why, in my opinion, the, the message for a lot of time, the message didn't stick. So you will pass this message to someone, you will say it's urgent, but it didn't stick. People will hear that. Maybe they will be concerned throughout one day. But then in the second or third day, they, they are like, okay, I'll just go on with my life. And now the message has turned. Now the message has been all about climate justice, all about the social implications of a natural process, which is the climate change and the climate chaos we are living in nowadays. This idea that the people who didn't cause the problem or the people that were least responsible to cause the problem are the ones suffering the most and a lot of times suffering in a way that terminates their own lives when a hurricane hits or a wildfire hits or drought goes and you go to hunger because you basically don't have a means of, of being alive. This idea of justice, it's something that resonates with everyone. And then the idea that we have the tools because finally we as activists can say like, just look to the Paris Agreement. Just look to the commitment you've already made. It's, we are not pushing the agenda saying like, we need to do other things. We are just saying we need to do what you already committed to. And so the stickiness of the message is quite important and also the context of the message. We are more and more seeing the natural impacts of climate change. We are more and more seeing human suffering due to climate change. People are finally connecting all those dots and the younger generation even more so because what they are seeing and what they are being told is that Okay, we now live in a world that is a lot warmer than it was when my grandparents were born. Now we live in a world with a lot more natural problems around us. That is affecting our lives. We have the science knowing where we are heading. We have the science knowing where we need to go if we are to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. We have the solutions. Then, like... Why the hell are you not working for a better world? Why the hell are we not acting for climate change? And in the end, me as a young children, me with no power, I am the one who is going to suffer from the impacts of, of what you have done as previous generations, of where you put us. And that kind of outrage that kind of context that generates this outrage, it's very important for the message to, to go viral too. And then in the end, we also need the kind of, it, the people that pass the message are quite important. So it's not only the stickiness of the message, the way we are conveying the message, it's not only the context of that message, which finally we have a context that in which the, the message resonates, but it's also the kind of people that are involved. The, and there are three kinds of people that, that need to be involved. One is the people that are like the experts, the people to which we go when we want to, to ask something about the environment. And like all these experts nowadays finally are saying 
climate change is real, climate change is human induced, and we need to act right now if we are to avoid the worst impacts. So the, the experts are already saying this, and that was a very important step. Second, we have the connectors spreading the message, which is the, what we nowadays call the influencers, but they, they exist not only in the social media space, they exist in our, own, in our own lives. Like we all have that kind of friend that knows everyone. <laughs> and that people are passing the message. And we, we are having a lot of these kind of influencers and connectors in our own lives, whether it is through social media, through the TV as opinion makers, or in our own lives as people we know as friends, these people are conveying this kind of message. And finally, and for, in my opinion, it's still where we lack uh, more work. We need to have kind of the, the sales people, which is the people that are then selling this idea of change to everyone. And that's the part where we lack more action, in my opinion, because we need like a salesperson for climate action and, and really for human rights in every single organization, whether it is a government, where it is a, an enterprise, whether it is a, just a, a group of friends. Um, but these people are, we have more and more people doing this work. Like 10 years ago, if we talked about climate change, it was almost impossible as a topic of conversation. We did a group of friends in Portugal. Nowadays, it's commonplace. And, and that's due to all these actions. So how can we mobilize? I think that it has a lot to do with the message and not so much with the ways we organize. But in terms of the ways we organize, then I, I feel we need to do to organize in smart ways that one, allow for coordinated action, like everyone is conveying the same message and going around that message, but two, allowing for every single people to just grab that message and convey it in the way they want. And the climate strike movement in that sense was uh, amazing because basically the idea can be implemented by anyone without any kind of approval. What they said is protest by every single Friday, striking school. And if you strike school every single Friday, if you strike for climate, if you strike to demand climate action, then we together might make a change. And this was a very powerful idea because Greta Thunberg, basically she did this in August last year in the Swedish parliament. In the first day, she didn't have no one around her. Then the media came because this was quite, a, quite an interesting news. Then the second time she already had some people, then she went to the UN to speak and spread the message. She didn't organize any other climate strike anywhere else. She, she basically just spread the idea and the message and people started grabbing the message and started to organize their own strikes. And bits by bits, it started to spread within other countries in Europe. Uh, it was big in Belgium, big in Luxembourg, big in uh, Germany, big in the UK. And then she just said, okay, we should do one that was global. And so basically on the 15th of March, every, around, every place around the world that will know this message, they could just do it. And that's why we had like the biggest mobilization for climate ever. Because the message was sticky, the context was there, and we had all the kinds of, of different people spreading the message. And that's why we had 1.6 million students in that day, in the 15th of March. And that's why in the next week, on the 24th of March, we'll also have a lot of people. And now the interesting part is, it's already not only the kids. So basically the, the idea just spread. So now the, it started as the kids, then the parents said, I really agree with this, so I should go with my kids to this strike. And then the teacher said, I also agree with that. And in Portugal, this is the case that some directors of schools are actually saying, you don't even need to miss class. We are just going to close our school in this day and go with the school to strike and to protest for this. And then if the parents, if the teachers are in, if the school directors are in, the, the general audience and the general public is getting together. And so this on the 24th is already a, a global climate strike and on the 27th of September we'll also have another global climate strike and so the, the momentum is building up and in my opinion the key is really to keep the message spreading 
keep it simple and to make sure the context is there and the message is good enough to stick and to stay in people's minds for other actions. Okay, so we have like 10 minutes, a little bit less. Um, I don't know if you have any more questions. I have maybe just one or two more things to say, but I'll give you 30 seconds to, to consider any questions that you might have. So, okay, then I'll say just one or two more things. One, it's the way I, I actually came to do this webinar. I've already done one webinar for Global Change Makers, so I'm quite privileged to have two uh, opportunities and thank you for Global Change Makers to allowing me to do this. And basically what Courtney was saying, Courtney from Global Change Makers, a friend of mine was asking, is there anyone that wants to provide a webinar on advocacy? And I just answered, okay, it's not exactly advocacy in the usual sense, like lobbying and, and advocating for change in the traditional way. But I really feel that uh, grassroots mobilization and these kind of strikes and social movements going on are one of the best types of advocacy. And, and nowadays, they are quite current. They are quite in every single concerned person radar. And so for me, it was, it was also interesting to just say, okay, why not saying that grassroots mobilization might be a way of advocacy? And, and she totally agreed. So I just said, okay, I might do this in very different angles. I might say, what's the role of this grassroots mobilization for advocacy? How can we build a movement? How can we mobilize people? And one of, one of the ideas we had together was really, how can you mobilize youth in specific in an individualized world? And for me, that's a very hard question um, because I guess we still don't know exactly how this is happening. <laughs> so it's something we can say right now, oh, do this, so we have this toolkit of, of best case practices for how to mobilize youth in an individualized world. Um, but one thing I, I was discussing with some friends from the US climate strike yesterday was this idea of the need for a group, the need for a community. And although we do live in a very individualized world in terms of the kind of values that are conveyed usually, uh, this idea that you need to make a difference just by yourself, you need to be success, successful focusing on one entrepreneur instead of the whole team. You need to be this or you, 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 you. And again, then we look inwards and we say me, 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 me. But in the end, we all need and we all earn for a sense of community. I felt that through my life. In, global, in the case of Global Change Makers, for me, it was a, in 2012, it was a, a really a a changing point in my life because I, I was feeling in Portugal, although we had a big organization uh, and we had great people together, I still felt like it was just a, a drop in the ocean and we were very few and this was making so much of a difference. But then I went to Global Change Makers and I understood like, oh, whew, these guys are doing amazing things worldwide. And we are, although a lot of times we don't know each other, there are so many people doing the same with the same values towards the same ultimate goal, which is, in my opinion, uh, a world where the place where you live, the place where you were born, where the, the context where you were born and everything don't constrain, are, are not constraints for your own life. And this is the whole idea about privilege and about the, the power we have that we didn't strive for. And in my case, as a white male from a mostly rich country, uh, I totally understand privilege in the way that that has played in my life. Like, I don't know what it is to be a girl um, with all the issues associated 
with discrimination, with gender inequality. I really don't know what it is to have a different color of skin and being discriminated just because of that. I really don't know what it is to have to work in a field to raise the food that I need to just survive another day. And that was all things that I didn't strive to have. I just happened to be born here with these conditions to be able to live the life I've lived. And so that idea of, of community, of other people striving for, for the same goal, was something that totally resonated and connected to me. And, and I totally felt that within the global change maker communities, and I've been part of other communities of change makers, of people making the change. And I, I don't feel we live in a, to be honest, in a very individualized world in the sense that everyone wishes to be more isolated than before. We have the same earning for community and this kind of, of movements when we feel we are part of a community of a group of people striving for the same goal, whatever it is, it makes a big difference. And, and for me, the, the climate strike movement, it's, it's been this. It's also a big community of people that are like-minded and striving for the same goal. And I feel for a lot of young people, they don't even know exactly <laughs> everything that is on the things that we demand from, from the government as an action. But when they saw Greta and when they saw the change that they were making together, they felt, I'm part of this too. I'm also a young person. I also know the facts. I also want change. And if I was going to do this before all by myself, it would be strange. But now, even if I do this all by myself in my own country, I'm already connected to something bigger. I'm already connecting to some other people that are doing exactly the same in somewhere else in the world. And then two or three people think the same and then get together and they start to strike. And that's what's happening with the movement. Then you know someone that is in the strike. And so you go to the strike and you are there and you strive for the same. And that's for me as a final thought of, of this idea of being in an individualized world. That for me is very important. We, we really don't want to be so alone. In the end, we all want community and we are together in this. We are together in being enough to change the world for better and to make sure that we live this world in a better place than it was before. And for me, that's the, the final thought. So thank you very, very much for bearing with me for so long. A lot of people I know wouldn't be able to bear with me for so long, so thank you. <laughs> and really looking forward for, for your questions or reactions or anything, so feel free to connect with me through Instagram. For me, right now, it's the, the main means of, of connecting. And I'd really love to, to work with any of you that are with the same goal of having a, a very much better world. So count me on your team. I totally guess and understand that you are in our team. So thank you very, very much. Muito obrigado.